Okay, so this is lecture 24, and we are continuing to the go to chapter 15, which is about uh, lower bounds uh, for uh, kernelization, and uh, we're going to take off from section 15.1.3, which is about and distillation distillations and I'm going to go slowly to that because this would be kind of a reminder of what uh, we were talking about uh, and and compositions What we were talking about uh, uh, previous uh, lecture. Okay, so here's what's going on. What is a, a, a distillation? So we looked on the O version before, and we're just going to call it endist. So what is this? So this is where we have a language. We have two languages, L and R, right? And um, Right, and, and we had inputs. The basic idea is that we have many inputs, x1 to xt that belongs, that belong to, you know, those are strings. And we have an algorithm that takes all those strings um, and generates some new string, right? Um, It generates a new string and generate a new string, let's call it y or yk. You know, there would be two different versions. There would be the end distillation, there would be the end compression. And the end compression is the one where the output has this uh, fixed parameter tractable parameter. We care about the distillation without this parameter. Um, and such that in the old case, what we had was that uh, y was in this uh, language r, if and only if. In the old case, it was one of them. In our case, it is for all i, xi belongs to l, right? So, and the important thing is that y is short, right? Y has to be polynomial in the length in the maximum length of any of the inputs, right? So the way to think about it is that uh, distillator takes many inputs and compresses them into one, one instance, right? And the, inst the new instance is two is in, the in this new other language R, if and only if um, all of the instances in the end case we're in the original language, right? We saw the old distillation, this is the old ver uh, end version. And uh, the cross composition is the same thing, except that in cross composition, we generate uh, an instance that have a K, have this parameter K, right? And this parameter K cannot be too long, cannot be too uh, large, right? It again has to follow some kind of uh, polynomial size requirement, right? Um, again, the the polynomiality of this parameter k has to be, you know, polynomial of the the input, uh, you know, the maximum size of any of the inputs, right? So really, what's happening is that uh, either a comp composition or the distillation, such a polynomial time, compresses the problem into a single one instance, right? And the intuition is that if you can do that. If a, a language is distillator, then it's essentially um, you're very close to being able to to solve it efficiently, right? So in particular, one gets the following theorem: uh, the book length of this theorem is quite hard, unlike the old version. Uh, I have no reason to doubt that they are telling the truth. <laughs> 
So this is theorem 15.11. So this theorem states that if we have an L distillation from L to R, to languages, then L, uh, notice that R, there's no assumption no, R might not be even decidable. Um, then L immediately belongs to this uh, coin P over poly. Um, coin P over poly is this uh, uh, coin P where you're allowed non-uniform uh, advice, right? Um, um, so, you know, it's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty strong uh, statement in particular, if L is NP hard, that would, uh, you know, and you find a language like that, that proves that NP is containing coin P over poly, which is extremely unlikely. It's a weaker assumption, of course, than P not equal NP, but it's still very strong. Okay. And, and now we get a similar result for cross a composition with end condition, which yield the following theorem. Okay, so we get theorem 15.12. This theorem states that if we have a language L and it cross composes uh, into a language Q, then uh, Q does not have a polynomial compression, right? So, um, a polynomial compression, you can just think about it intuitively as being a polynomial kernel. It's not quite the same, but for our purposes, let's just say it's the same to keep things simple. Um, and to remind you, an end, compo uh, end composer is one that takes instances, a collection of instances, and generate one instance where the single instance, the parameter is much smaller. Okay? So... Um, so it's essentially a way to prove that the language does not have a, a polynomial kernel. Um, and here does not have means that if it does, then you know we get the regular NP is contained in coin P over poly, which we said is unlikely. Okay. So, uh, and let's give an example. It's kind of a trivial example. So you have um, G1, K, G2, K, you know, I give you graphs that, um, you know, I ask whether the tree width of those graphs is at most K, okay? And G, T, K, right? So you can trivially um, generate a new instance, which is the union of all those graphs, right? So just this joint union of all those graphs, and then the parameter K, right? And this new graph, G1, G2, and so on. This new graph has three with K, if and only if all the input, uh, uh, graphs have three with at most K. So this is just an... Uh, uh, and then cross composition, which immediately implies that uh, three width does not, three width is just deciding if a graph has, uh, so it's not to be NP hard, deciding if a graph has three width K, and this immediately by the three width is, um, it does not have a small, does not have a polynomial kernel. So that's, um, yeah, so that's, that's a useful property to have. Okay, so now we're going to do some further example that would require a bit more work, unfortunately. So without fear, we continue to section 15.2 examples. So the first example is set splitting, which is a very cute problem and a very nice reduction. Um, so here's how it works. Well, let me first define the problem. Set splitting is, think about set cover, right? So you have a set U, a ground set U, and a set F of, F is a subset of the universe, you know, family of subsets. And now you ask, 
the question is, does there exist a set X such that, well, we want two things, right? We want that for every F in F, X hit it, right? So it's a hitting set, right? But here is where things become interesting. We also require that uh, F does not, X does not cover F. Okay, so if you look on F minus set of X, there are all elements that are not covered. Okay. So the question is, is there a, a splitting set? And uh, this problem is NP hard. Uh, because what else can it be? Proof by uh, laziness. Um, but we want to prove that uh, it doesn't have a small kernel, right? So to this end, uh, we get the following result. Theorem. Um, okay, so the result is that uh, set splitting does not have a polynomial. Uh, set splitting has a, a cross uh, a cross compress, uh, composition, an all cross com composition that we will show, and as such, it does not have a polynomial kernel unless you know pigs can fly and stuff like that, which is computationally unlikely. And the important thing here is that the the parameter here is the size of the universe, right? Which is kind of uh, interesting, right? Because there is a trivial algorithm with the size of u, right? You go over all possible subsets of the universe, there are two to the uh, use such uh, subset. For each such set, you try, you check whether it's a splitting set or not, right? So essentially, this says that you cannot, even if we give you an instance that looks sparse, you cannot reduce the, the ground set of the instance. That's what this theorem says. And the proof is, is clever. Um, let's see if I can do it justice. So, to begin with, assume that we have instances. Uh, U1, F1, U2, F2, and so on, right? We have instances. Uh, now, one part of this cross-composition was the fact that we had an equivalence relation and we can assume that all the instances belong to the same equivalence relation, and the equivalence relation has to be polynomially computable, blah, 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 blah. In our case, to our purpose, it just means that we can assume that the ground set of all the instances, u1, u2, and so on, they're all of the same size. Okay. So, um, they're all of size k, right? So we are going to just assume that because the cross composition allowed to assume that. And now um, what we need to do, we need to match all those instances together into one big instance without increasing significantly the size of the ground set, right? Uh, such that this new instance is true if and only if the original set is true. So to this end, uh, I'm going to assume that t is a power of 2, right? We, uh, you know, because we can always uh, duplicate instances to get this. So the way to think about it is s is just log base 2 of t, and it's an integer, okay? Okay, why is this interesting, right? So the, the intuitively what you want to, to say, you know, think about the, a set ff that belongs to fi guide instance, right? I'm going to replace it with F, uh, you know, the way to think about it, I'm going to replace it with a pair, which is Fi, right? Meaning uh, the set F together with the index I. Now, of course, how do we write, the, write I? I is a binary string of length S, right? You can think about this 0, 1, 0, and so on, right? The binary representation. So what we are going to do, we are going to create two S new elements, right? So let's call them 
נתת קודם A, A0, B0, A1, B1, and so on, so on. So I give you those two S elements, and the idea, of course, is that you can, given any binary string of length S, you can encode it by choosing the corresponding element, right? One would be the bottom uh, element, zero would be the top element, right? So, so you, can, you get the choice of, of S elements, right? And now F, so as such, the, the set Fi, F is just a set, right? This is just F. It's some elements that are subset of U, right? That's what F is. And now we're going to add to it this uh, uh, set encoding of I, which the set encoding is what I just described. It's a subset of element that encode the, the parameter I, uh, the index I, right? So that's what we are doing. Notice that uh, so we do it for all the sets in all the i, right? So we are going to get a new instance. U hat is going to be uh, U union with this uh, bit, you know, A1, A0 to AS and B0 to BS. So, you know, the size of U hat is going to be the size of U plus log of T, right? So to remind you, if you go through the definitions, the cross composition allowed you to be polynomial in the size of the in maximum size of the input plus logarithm in the number of instances. So we are using it here. And, and the new uh, the new set of uh, family of sets is just going to be the union over i of this uh, the encoding of this fi. Right, so you know, I, you need over F in FI of this uh, encoding on F of F and I, which I described about why. Copy F and add the binary bits of F. So this is the, the, the thing. Okay, this is not quite enough. We need to do another thing. So we're going to do union over I going from zero to S of AI, BI. Okay. So what is going on? We get this new instance, u hat f hat. Okay. Now, because we added those uh, pairs a, i, b, i, and we are asking in the new set, is there a splitting set? Then from every set that have a pair, you have to choose one of the elements, right? This is kind of immediately, by the way, tell you why the problem is, is np hard, right? Because you can encode the uh, assignment of uh, sat, essentially, with the set. Okay. So you have to choose each one of them, right? Which means that you can think about this choice as choosing the index i, right? So if there is a solution, then it chooses, chooses index i, right? Now, so let's fix, let's call it capital i just for a keep of clarity of notation. So think about this index i, this set of, this is an encoding of i, right? It's a subset of this, uh, uh, these 2s binary bits. All the sets that belong to instances that are different than i are going to immediately be satisfied by, by, this, uh, by this instance, right? Um, so, so the only sets that are not going to be satisfied by the encoding of i are all the sets that belong to this instance i, right? And as such, because there we are either going to use all the elements of none or, or none of, uh, of or none of the elements in the encoding, right? And in fact, by the way, I should say that uh, for technical reasons, they don't just uh, you know fi. In fact, is going to be two sets, right? It's either it's going to be as I said f union with the encoding of i. And in fact, it's also going to be, they also add the complement set, F with the complement, complement encoding of I. 
אין טעם להתחיל עם בטא, אוקיי? So one of those two, well it is important for the proof of correctness, so for the choice of i, we choose the assignment i, for one of those instances, none of the elements are chosen in the encoding, right? Which means, let's assume that we had chosen this, for example, all those bits, but that means that you must uh, satisfy, uh, you must split f for all the f in this set. Okay, by the way, you have to be a bit careful in calling here, you had one extra bit because, you know, you want to, uh, uh, because some low level technical issues. Um, and that's it, that's the correctness, right? So you choose the index i, for this index i, the family f of i, the encoding bits uh, cover all the bits in one of the two, either the, the regular instance or the complement instance, let's say the regular instance, and then the set itself has to be split, which means that this instance is true if and only if the original fi, the i instance, is true. And of course, the correctness goes also in the other direction. So that's the proof. A bit hand wavy, but I think uh, hopefully it's convincing and sound enough that this is indeed correct. Okay. So the next, the next example uses this idea of polynomial reduction that preserves parameters. So this is called a polynomial parameter transformation or PPT if you want. And it's just what you think it is, right? It takes an instance with parameter k and in polynomial time it reduces it to a new instance with parameter k prime and you require that k prime is uh, polynomial in k and of course, um, you all want to do it in polynomial time, right? So if we have this uh, PPT, then we immediately get the following uh, theorem 15.15. This theorem says that if we have two languages, right, and there is a PPT Uh, from P to Q, and if P does uh, does not have a polynomial compression, which to remind you is just uh, essentially equivalent in our for our purposes, equivalent to polynomial kernel. If it does not, if P does not have polynomial kernel, then Q does not have polynomial kernel. Polynomial compression. And the proof, of course, is obvious, right? Because if there was a polynomial compression for Q, then because of this PPT, there would be a polynomial compression for P. This is uh, same old, same old, right? As far as uh, NP-complete reductions. Okay, so this is a useful thing because it allows us to propagate uh, problems that we know do not have a polynomial kernels. So as an example, we're going to look on Steiner tree. Steiner tree. The parameterization here is a bit weird, so let's go carefully to it. I give you a graph G and a set of terminals uh, K. I guess K is from terminals. I don't know. It is the terminals. And we have a parameter L. Okay, and the question is, is there a spanning tree is there a tree, a tree that spans k, right, it spans all the vertices, all the terminals, um, using L edges, using at most L edges, right. So we already saw, in fact, an alg a fixed parameter tractable algorithm that works in something like 2 to the k uh, n of 1, right? 
that, that was, uh, you know, or I don't remember if it was to do the K or K factorial, whatever. You know, the idea was to, that you're guessing the tree structure um, and you can set over the strict structure or more formally you do dynamic programming over the subsets. Um, you know, we saw it earlier in the course. Okay. Okay, so the other problem we need to, for this example, is this colorful, colorful graph motif. Okay, so what is colorful graph motif? I give you a graph G and a coloring coloring of G uh, by K colors. Uh, and the question is, uh, is there exist a, a H a subgraph, connected subgraph, connected subgraph, connected subgraph, of G such that uh, H contains exactly one vertex of each color, one vertex of each color. Uh, and it's not hard to show that this problem is LP hard, right? Uh, I, you know, uh, I came up with a reduction from Hamiltonian uh, Hamiltonian cycle in directed graph where you call out the edges and then you know you need to do the standard gadget stuff to argue that in fact uh, you know it doesn't really matter that you're working with edges and so on. Okay, so um, the obvious observation here is that if I give you instances G1K, G2K, Wait, uh, well, officially it has to be G1, C1, K, right? The coloring C1, G2, C2, K, right? I give you um, instances, well, as usual, K instances of this problem, right? Then uh, it's all composers immediately, right? Because you can just, you, you do the usual uh, nonsense. You just take the graphs and... Uh, Put them next to each other, right? G1, G2, and so on. And clearly, if one of them has a connected subgraph that is representing each color, then this resulting instance have this property, and vice versa. So, so a colorful graph motif so theorem, a colorful colorful, this theorem is what, 15, 16. Colorful graph motif um, has uh, all cross composition, which we saw above, it's easy which says that he doesn't have, which implies that they don't have polynomial, polynomial compression. Okay, well, it doesn't really matter for our purposes, um, unless peaks can fly, which is computationally speaking unlikely. Okay, so, um, so now we want to do a reduction from one of those, you know, from Steiner tree into this, uh, problem, and that will be the next step. Okay, so the claim is that there exists a PPT, right, this parameterized reduction, and people here, uh, let me emphasize, this is PPT, not PPE. It's a completely different thing. So there is a PPT from colorful graph uh, motif into standard tree, and the reduction, in fact, is pretty simple if you think about it. So let's prove it. The idea is the following. You give me an instance of PPT. Sorry. 
I give you, a, you give me an instance of colorful graph uh, motif. So the vertices are already colored, right? Let's put them in groups. V1, V2, 2, Vk, right? And essentially what the question originally asked is, is there a, a, a connected subgraph that have one, exactly one vertex from each one of the groups, right? So this, uh, you can think about this with L, um, right, um, right, is there a connected subgraph? So we want to reduce it to Steiner tree, and for the Steiner tree thing, the idea is that we are going to ask, is there a, a spanning tree, right, with one vertex from each color, right? So to this end, what we're going to do, we're going to add a terminal for every color and connect it to all the vertices in its color class, like that, right? So let H be the resulting graph. And now what we're going to do, all those vertices that they added, they're going to be the terminals, right, in the set K. They're going to be all the terminals. And now what we are asking is, is there a, a spanning tree that uh, spans all the terminals and how many edges it would need to have? Well, it needs to have k edges going into the vertex, right? So, and then we need, uh, uh, you know, all the edges connecting the spanning tree here. So this is going to be k minus one, right? So this is two k minus one, right? So this is L. Right, so we're really asking in the instance H, is there a, a spanning tree? Um, uh, is there a spanning tree of all the terminals with L edges? And if there is, then it means that the answer to the colorful original colorful graph motif is true, and it's if and only if. Right, this readily implies that. Um, and this is, so this is the, the proof. And uh, that implies the second part of this theorem. So theorem is 15.17, right? So we show the reduction, right, from a colorful graph motif uh, into Steiner tree. Colorful graph motif, we show the PPT into a Steiner tree. Right, but colorful graph motif uh, trivially has an all, comp uh, uh, all cross uh, composition, which means that uh, colorful graph motif, motif, not F, colorful graph motif um, does not have a polynomial compression of polynomial kernel. But now we got it immediately because of this uh, reduction that this implies that Steiner tree does not have a a polynomial compression, or oh, if you want. Right, namely it doesn't have polynomial kernel in our language. So we prove what we wanted to prove. Right, uh, so that's nice.